thank you, Bob. Uh, first, it's, it is a, a genuine privilege uh, to be here. I, I don't know, maybe you all know that uh, the University of Ver Vermont and the Gund Institute in particular uh, are really regarded worldwide as the center of ecological thinking and of innovation and directions. So um, that is wonderful for me to come to talk to you about some of these matters but it also lays a heavy responsibility on all of you. So what I'm going to do is suggest some things, because I'm an outsider and a visitor, that I think you all ought to do. But I'm a partner in that since I'm doing some of it myself, so it's all we all, we all ought to do as well. Uh, Bob asked me originally to talk about uh, problems of vision, and he was starting, I think, from the death of environmentalism, which you all probably have read and wanting to take it forward in a positive sense, what we might learn from that. And so I reread that document, and it, by way of kind of prepping for this conversation, and I had some problems with it. And my problems were not the ones that usually you hear from the environmentalists who, environmental organizations which were challenged by that, that particular document, and I assume many of you here know the document, so I won't recapitulate it entirely. Um, what you find the argument there stated as is that the environmental movement needs that's the term. And it needs positive direction, which goes beyond environmental problems. And it, although it talks primarily about the problematic of global warming, what it actually comes up with as its one real example of what to do is something called the Apollo Project. And those of you who probably know what the Apollo Project is, which, is, which I think is a very interesting project, which is an attempt to show how many jobs state by state, nationally, through a, whole, a full scale strategy to reduce U.S. dependence on oil, posing it in terms of the positive industrial development, the positive energy conservation, the positive work that could be done, rather than the problematic of oil or global warming. And it puts this forward as a vision. Uh, I have no problem with, with that particular set of proposals. Uh, in fact, I think it's a very good set of proposals. But it is not a vision. It is a political strategy attempting to unite, and a good one, attempting to unite labor, communities, some industries, selective industries, and some congressmen who can pull in with the environmental movement in order to achieve a specific goal. I'm for specific tactics of that kind. But that is not a vision, and indeed to the extent it is not a vision, and to the extent we think that narrowly, they were always, con they have been criticized for thinking too broadly, but I'm going to suggest they think too narrowly. To that extent, my suggestion is that we are part of the problem, not part of the solution. So let me say what I mean. There is a distinction between a political strategy and a political proposal of, which is legislative of that kind, let's call that a political initiative. Another category of work that people are involved with, many here in the state of Vermont, are projects. And I want to underline these distinctions. I call that projectism. I think it's very valuable to develop projects. But that is also not a vision, though it might contribute to a vision. There is another category that I find much more interesting and which I'm going to urge you to consider as central to the argument that which if we do not deal with will deal with us, which is systemic design. Systemic design. Now let me give you some suggestions about what I mean by systemic design is the focus not any of the others, and vision is, is let me just mention vision as, as it is traditionally used rather than as it's used in that document. Vision as traditionally used in political theory and political economy is a large set of values, that is democrat, democratic processes, small communities, ecologically sustainable communities, a vision of lots of time and good uh, happy lives built by a sense of community, um, it's, a, it's a large value perspective. So note the distinction, a value perspective, a political strategy, projectism, and I want to talk about something else called systemic design. 
So we had a, one, one way to come into the problem would be the following. I assume you've all noticed that at the narrowest level of discussion, the United States Constitution, the Madisonian design, uh, is a failure. It is supposed to check and balance, but it does not check or balance the capacity of small elites to take the country to war. The country is easily manipulated by elites. I happen to work in the United States Senate during the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, in which a fraudulent claim, in that case that we were attacked, was manipulated by the executive to take the entire society into war at the loss of some 50,000 American lives and probably two to three million Vietnamese lives. The checks and balances did not check and balance in that particular design. That's at the level of constitutional design. It is obviously also the case now that a small elite has taken the country to war because they can manipulate information and the design of the system and that's the emphasis I want to give you. The design of the system made it possible for them, it was so designed that it could easily be manipulated, that they could take the country to war. Controlling information, controlling the press, controlling various levers of power. So there is a flaw in our design at that very narrow level of constitutional design. If you ask questions about some of the ecological problems we face, and I suspect you know this, most of you probably agree with me, you'll say at the heart of some of the problems is the large for-profit giant corporation. We see it as polluting, we see it as foisting unnecessary resources onto the public, as foisting, promoting unnecessary consumption, dislocating communities, undermining and undergirding the spread of sprawl, etc., etc., etc. Now that's one of the elements of current design of American corporate capitalism. So I want to bring it out as that form rather than we ought to deal with it, we ought to control it, we ought to regulate it, etc. Remember, I worked for Gaylord Nelson, so I know about those problems. But it is a feature, and I want you to think with me about the design of this system that incorporates as the central piece of the American economy the large for-profit corporation. Now, most people in the United States and much of the European environmental movement believes that the way in which you deal with that, that at particular entity is through either regulation or tax policy, primarily regulation, or various forms of government incentive and control. That's how you do it. And you might point to Scandinavia, for instance, for better environmental protections, or you might point to the, in some cases, uh, probably the Scandinavians are the best, but the Netherlands for those kind of changes that you might, thought, you might uh, think are valuable. You might even point, as the document in question points, the death of environmentalism, to the Nixon era in America, where the Environmental Protection Agency was established by a Republican president. <laughs> Furthermore, the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts were passed by a Republican president. So those are models in which you can get some regulation for that particular entity. My suggestion to you first is that that design, the balancing of the corporation or its restriction in the United States is no longer a viable design. I just said something very, very controversial and heavy. I just said the design of attempting to regulate and balance the corporation is no longer a viable design for a system that wants to be ecologically sustainable, and I would also say democratic. So that's a large contention. If it's true, it will force us into what else is possible, and then how do you get there? So you need to struggle with it. And my suggestion, I gather you had someone here a week ago or two weeks ago who cited the development of the civil rights movement as a model which might be followed in future out of nowhere as as it were created enough force to regain the initiative and achieve great change in American society. You might also say the, envir the environmental movement itself is a model of that and so too the feminist movement in the 1960s. But something has changed in the United States so here's the proposition about why the model of attempting to reform and regulate and manage the corporate center of the political economy, in my view, no longer works. 
essentially what you had in the development of this particular very weak uh, welfare state by comparison with other welfare states was the development of some counterbalancing force and there were two kinds that managed the, the corporation slightly the most important of which in all countries is, is an organized labor movement the centerpiece of all progressive movements electing Democrats if you like and making Republicans less conservative if you like has been a po the power of labor even when they were not totally allied with the environmental movement they became part and parcel of having a democratic house and a democratic senate they counterbalanced the corporation to a degree now the american labor movement was never like the swedish labor movement which is 85 percent of the, of the labor force is organized at its peak the american labor movement in 1953 hit 35.3 percent it is now 7.4% in the private sector and declining. It will probably be 5%. It's a little over 12 totally when you include the public service sectors. The balancing force that allowed the assembly of a progressive coalition to balance that entity, which developed in the 20th century, was a 20th century phenomenon, and it is on the way out in this country. That's a second proposition which needs to be grappled with if you're interested in building the power to constrain the corporation. It is over. That means that the system design of the 20th century, if you accept that proposition, which allowed for the rise of the corporation and some counterbalancing by organized labor supporting a progressive politics, no longer works. George Bush is not an accident. And he's not a framing problem. Though framing is important to politics. And he's not even a vision problem. He is a problem to my, of the underlying structural relationships that have changed in the political economy. And that's only one of them. By the way, I'm going to give you an optimistic way out. This is not all pessimism. I think there's a way through, maybe. But I don't think it's the way through is by illusion. The second oddity, which has also changed radically, and I underline the word radical because most of my liberal friends, I come out of liberalism, I work for both in the House and the Senate and the State Department for liberal administrations. The second element that has changed radically, and you cannot have it anymore, if you think you're going to base your political economy on it, you are, in my view, misleading yourself and those who listen to you. The second element that's changed radically is that the civil rights movement achieved its goal, thank God, disrupted the politics of terror and violence of the South, and turned it into a right-wing enclave based on implicit racism that elected Republican presidents. There is no other country in the world in which a vast quadrant of the system, the South, is organized by implicit and explicit racism so as to not allow the formation both of the unions or of progressive politics and to continually thwart that politics and move it to the right. The oddity, and it was an oddity and an aberration that everyone took for granted, was that for most of the 20th century and a hundred years after the Civil War, that oddity was called democratic. It was always should have been right-wing Republican, but because Lincoln was a Republican, it happened to be in response in the Democratic Party, which meant it helped elect Democratic presidents like Truman and Roosevelt and Kennedy. And the last one probably, though I think we may get a Democratic president that We'll talk about it. The last one on the easy way in maybe was Bill Clinton on the border state. It is over. It is a Republican enclave. And if you ask the second question why George Bush exists, is because the old Confederacy is the heart of the red states. And if you look for red states that are really red, it is the old Confederacy. There is no other country like this. Many countries have racial minorities. But none have a huge quadrant, and we don't face the problem that has that implicit racism. I am less interested for this discussion in the problem of race, though it is very important. 
but that it is another element that allows for the dividing and conquering of progressive forces and eliminating the system that you and I grew up to think was natural, namely the balancing system of progressive 20th century politics. It is not only the collapse of labor, but the collapse of this oddity which is behind the drive to the right and the support of the corporate institution. So that when you look at the declining environmental changes we see and the incapacity of the government to do much about them, do not ignore these two factors. They are structural. So if there's a way forward, you have to deal with them, in my view. And the third element you probably know more about than I do, which is the question of globalization. And as you probably realize, globalization, for many reasons, not only under, particularly for what we're talking about now, weakens communities, weakens bargaining power, and strengthens the corporate hand. And you can, many studies have been done of how this happens. So there you are. The 20th century is over. If you think the model of regulating the corporation, which was based on powerful unions, lack of globalization to a substantial degree, and the oddity in the United States of the Democratic South. If you think that model will work again, I suggest you think again. Note carefully that when Nixon put together the Environmental Protection Agency and when the Clean Water Act and the, the Clean Air Act were passed, Nixon was a northern president. He could not get access to the South he was playing to the North entirely because that's where the Republican Party was. The South was still called Democratic. And the whole point of the Nixon strategy, successful strategy, was to blow the, the Republican, the Democratic Party out of the South after the Civil Rights Movement, and he did it. But at the time the environmental gains under a Republican president were made, he was still playing to a Northern audience because he couldn't play to the South. It was called Democratic. So again, if you go back to that era for your precedents, I don't think you're going to find them. I also don't think, though I am a great admirer of the civil rights movement for reasons I'll come to in a minute, I don't think you're going to find exactly the precedents in the civil rights movement that you want either. Someone mentioned, I think, that Martin Luther King had been mentioned in the civil rights movement in the great era. Martin Luther King ended his life, I think you all know, regarding the achievements of the Civil Rights Movement as preliminary and inevitably once they hit the power of the political economy and the economics of the large corporation directly, as he said privately to his staff on many occasions, we no longer can face this without dealing with problems that used to be called socialism. Whether or not he was right about that, he understood there was a structural problem that was blocking the Civil Rights Movement, not simply a political problem. Let me say what I'm going to say, what I've been saying in another way and why in the, in the 60s and 70s this would have called, been called a heavy rap for those of you older than some of the others. I don't think we face an environmental crisis. I don't think we face a political crisis. I think we face a systemic crisis. If that's true, then the only solution is the redesign and the achievement of an alternative system. It may not be possible, or it might be possible. But if people are serious about the degree of problems, particularly environmental and ecological problems that are emerging, my suggestion to you is that the issue is systemic, not political, and not primarily cultural. That is, the, desi the design of the system is the problem. And the old balancing mechanism is over. We may very well be back to the early part of the 20th century in the United States before the rise of the labor movement when many of these issues were debated at that point and then, you know, the oddities, the other oddities of the 20th century, if you throw them on the table, the first quarter of the century, great difficulties, great mo labor movement, great fights and, and then Great Depression, recession, 1914, bailed out by World War I. And similarly, the Great Depression, second quarter of the century, bailed out by World War II. Third quarter of the century, Cold War, Vietnam War, and more wars, though in decline relative to the GDP, solving the problems of the political economy in, and diverting attention, 
in the third quarter of the century, and plausibly one of the possibilities of the coming period, the American public becoming more and more difficult to allow their sons and daughters to be killed, plausibly reducing the level and extent of interventions, though they seem to go on. Vietnam was higher than this one, and perhaps the next will be less. But war was a part of the dynamic of the 20th century that also allowed these illusions to continue, in my view. Well, if we were to throw the problem directly on the table, the question would be, if you don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, what the hell do you want? And the second question would be, how do you get there? So let's begin with that set of questions. One of the, we had a seminar this morning. One of the questions to ask yourself is, can you actually assemble a democratic process that might possibly control the entities, either the corporate or, the problem is not simply corporate, corporate. it is the giant entity in the socialist system, which also has problems, as the American Corps of Engineers will teach you quickly, or the Soviet bureaucracy. So large-scale ent entities, although I think the corporation has a particular dynamic which needs to be dealt with, are important. One of the questions to ask yourselves, and I ask myself, and I ask it in this book that was passed out, is can you organize a viable democratic political economy in a continental system of 300 million people, which will probably be 500 million by mid-century? Is that possible? Let it, leave aside what you can do about it. It needs to be asked directly, carefully, and explicitly, can it be done? Madison thought it couldn't be done, and that's why he wanted it. The notion was if you could expand the system, you could keep the people from taking over from the elites. That's what Federalist 10 is all about. So he thought large scale meant that the elites could control at the center and divide and conquer the people. He also wrote in his letters to Jefferson privately, if it gets too big, remember this is at the time the United States was a series of colonies along the seaboard, not a continent. He said if it gets too big, he was probably thinking about if we ever got halfway to the Mississippi, if it gets too big, obviously we will be in danger of tyranny because the elites could divide and conquer. He wanted a balance, what he called a mean M-E-A-N, medium size scale, so he could keep the thing in balance. Well, if it is the case that very large scale in turns into an empire which elites can manipulate, I ask you to consider this like, like a brick sitting on the table in front of you. If that's true, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, you know. Don't let it get away. Then there will be no answer unless you can break down the size of the system to smaller scale, probably regions. The U.S. Constitution is 200 years old and failing. The question to ask yourself is where do we go in the next century? And the issue of regional scale, the most likely and most interesting ones would be New England on the one hand and the region we call California on the other taking initiatives. The regions reconstructing with self-conscious awareness, not that it's good for New England, but that, honey, there ain't no other way. If it is true that scale is critical to the problem of democracy and democratic and ecological control, then you will have to ask whether a continent can be managed, and if it can't, you will have to break it down either into most states are too small, though not all, and the continent's too big. That unit we call a region is the intermediate scale. I can talk to you a little bit, if we have time, about some of the things that are developing both in New England and Upper Northwest and in California being misorganized by Washington and people are beginning to say we could manage this economy ourselves, thank you, that kind of developmental process out of pain. But just as a logical proposition, can it be done, needs to be asked. The second one, can you actually, now here we go to John Dewey, we go to various democratic theorists, Benjamin Barber in the most modern one, Putnam's another one, uh, you, you'll find list one after another will give you this, John Stuart Mill, Tocqueville, of course. Can you have democracy in a system? Can you have democratic control in a system? 
if you do not have citizens who in their own lives and in their own communities actually know how to be democratic citizens really now that sounds really simple because you know people will vote in Burlington or people go to no it's a different question can people actually have the experience that they determine what happens in their own lives in their own communities John Stuart Mill called it the school of education and the proposition is not that it's a good thing. I don't want to get into is it a nice thing or a good thing to vote and get involved in civic engagement. And even in Putnam, I'm not even interested in the development of trust, which is a weak argument in my view, social capital argument. The argument is much harder edge and particularly important for people who care about the environment. The argument is you can't get there unless people actually learn to do it themselves in their own communities really. So that's a second argument. If you think that, and I suggest to put it there like another one of these bricks to look at, if it's true, then another requirement in the design of your political economy is establishing the conditions that make this possible. Now let me tell you some of the things that make it impossible. You're very lucky. You live, in a, you live in one of those communities where maybe you can actually do it. Burlington is one of the most interesting and best in the country. But this is not America. This is, most communities, it is all but impossible for citizens to deal with these problems, first because jobs are pulled out from under them and they are unstable. They can't, we have many studies, to the degree stability of jobs dis disintegrates the voting and civic participation go with it. Secondly, in most communities in the United States, possibly here, but most communities in the United States, the deal that is cut, there's a whole urban policy literature on this, which is cited briefly in the book, but if you're interested, it's well developed. As the Professor Peterson at Harvard calls it the uh, city limits is the name of his book. He doesn't mean geographic limits, he means the following. The deal that is cut in most cities is that the urban coalition cuts a deal with the developers and the corporations they want to bring in giving tax incentives and other incentives to the corporations in order to bring in jobs to the central city and they use up most of the budget. So there isn't much to decide about. The discretionary resources in most city budgets are so limited that no one would want to participate in democracy. Why in the hell bother? There's nothing to talk about. I'm not exaggerating. That is the reality and it's getting worse because of the fiscal crisis. So the reconstruction, one element of stability in local communities, we can talk about how to do that, and there are some very interesting things. The reconstruction of local stability is a precondition of democratic, growth, democratic control. You can't have it without. So then the question is, how do you get it? I'm suggesting to you a second element of a system design and its requirement. Local democratic experience really and substantial stability undergirding th such democracy really is a requirement. And we'll come to cities that are doing that and, and experience of how that can be done in many parts of the country. Note carefully, it is also the case that if you're interested in the problem of local pollution, job stability is also a requirement of a serious coalition to control pollution because if there isn't job stability, in most parts of the country, the people will take the cancer rather than lose the jobs. So it is an element also in a, ta in a tactics and a policy that's aimed at controlling local pollution by providing enough stability so that people can vote for and support regulation of polluting industries. Otherwise, they run away. So two elements. Very hard. Scale in local democracy and its requirements. The third element is the hardest one in my view, and it's back to that giant element called the giant corporation. How in the world do you actually face the issue of dealing with this entity? What are the options available? What are the options? In some sense, the argument is that the ownership of large-scale industry must become public. And I use the word in some sense carefully, and the book is called America Beyond Capitalism, Not America Socialism. 
because the socialist models have problems as The challenge becomes, I'm sorry, this is our problem jointly, if you don't like capitalism, if you don't like socialism, if you think there is a systemic design problem, and if you think there's a systemic crisis, then it is our joint responsibility to come up with a new design. Otherwise, you can't solve the problem. It's very simple, unfortunately. Well, one of the things that you can find, I'm going to come back to what I think is a long-term solution. One of the things you can find in this country, and in many other countries, and here is a website that's probably worth mentioning, www.community-wealth.org. Community-wealth.org. It's a website with lots of information on the kinds of things I'm going to mention now that are alternatives to the corporation. Practical, theoretical, research, uh, where to get more information, how to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If the model of the corporation, the large corporation, is itself in question, then how do we learn and develop alternative models? How do we do it? Well, it turns out that all over the country, just below the radar, and this is one of the hopeful things, though I think it is being driven by pain, all over the country, people are in fact developing the elements that point towards pieces of the solution. I assume you all know that there are more people involved in worker-owned companies in the United States than there are in unions in the private sector. Oh, you didn't know that? No, there are 11, there are, there are 11,500 companies that are either wholly or partially or increasingly as they get more stock, stock ownership owned by the employees. 11,500. 10 million men and women involved, that's more than the unions, the private sector unions. They are all over the country and people don't know about them. They are typical. I gather you had a big close, someone told me that last night, I gather you have a governor who was owned a big company and sold it out and you're now losing the jobs from it. The gu gubernatorial candidate. <laughs> yes. Senate candidate. Uh, in many parts of the country, instead of doing that, those, those companies can be sold with, with uh, public support to the employees and, and job reorganization is possible in many parts of the country. I don't know the details here, but it probably wasn't even an option on the table here or discussed. Uh, typically, in the state of Ohio, where this is the most advanced because of the big steel closings, and they learned some things from the steel closings and then applied them to many, many other industries. Uh, so Ohio is the, is the laboratory for this, although when you've got 11,500 companies, it's not clearly not the, minimally, it's, these are all over the country. They estimate the job retention costs to keep a job when an, a company sells to, and it can't be done always, but can be done in many cases, sells to the employees and are financed, there's financing mechanisms, again, that's what the website will give you all, how, this is, how it is actually done in practice. And I can give you some people who can help if you want to do it, by the way. There are some experts who are available and know a lot about this. The cost of retaining jobs in the state of Ohio per job doing these kind of sales, sales to worker-owned companies is about $500 a job. As compared with the costs of attempting to bring in outside corporations, which probably would have come anyway, seventy thousand to a hundred thousand dollars in subsidies per job so there's a very high payoff and they're very interesting i give it to you primarily because it's an example an emerging example of a different way of owning and controlling and it works best in large in small and medium size under 500 but many of them run to two to three thousand employees it is not i would not recommend it primarily for the large giant corporation but it teaches you that different ways are possible a second experiment going on around the country <laughs> Uh, in many, many parts of the country, and again, the press doesn't cut, cover this, is municipal ownership of industry, cities. Cities are owning various industries, particularly interested in, in the environmental area. Uh, I don't know if you do it here, trapping methane, turning it into uh, gas to produce electricity and to give jobs. That's very common in many parts of the country under city ownership. It used to be called city socialism. It is, municipal socialism, it is, it is now called the enterprising city. Uh, and, and it is being driven in the first instance, by the way, this is, this is the dialectic of pain and hope. The worker-owned companies are being driven because of pain and fear of losing jobs and a public response at the local level attempting 
to increase and control jobs and increase productivity. By the way, those studies are very clear. They increase productivity, competitiveness, wages at, as compared with other industries, and retirement. So they're, they're, they're on all four of those markers, they are more competitive and more profitable. In the case of municipalities, municipal owned entities, which is another alternative to the private corporation, what you're finding is a fiscal crisis is driving it. And you get both Republicans and Democratic mayors supporting it. City land development is very common. Wi-Fi, you see it, but also television, internet services, uh, experimentation, there a dozen hotels. There is an attempt, an odd attempt at an American version of municipal socialism emerging right below the, the radar of public attention. I give it to you only as an example of the development of an alternative form, grist for the mill of the design of larger corporate forms. There are 120 million people in the United States involved in co-ops, co-op members. Um, a very large number and growing in many parts of the country, not simply the REIs, but in hardware development, in, sa in sales of office supplies, grocery development, the fastest part of the grocery movement is the co-op movement, etc. Another form that is neither capitalist nor socialist, but grist for the mill of the design of the next corporation. There are land trusts, and you have one of the best ones in the country here. They are emerging all over the country as well. An oddity, a form of ownership that controls property on behalf of a small public and shows you a different handle on property ownership that is neither traditional socialist nor capitalist and controls costs and so forth. They're, they are emerging again driven by gentrification forces in many parts of the country. States are involved now heavily, ha by the way half the cities in the United States over 100,000 directly invest in companies in their own cities in order to keep jobs and own capital. Think of that. City, a model that is emerging of cities, half of them in the country, now investing directly, owning stock, taking shares and controlling interest in businesses in their own communities to keep jobs and to get part of the action. That's emerging too. Half the cities, you probably didn't have that, uh, you probably didn't know that. I didn't know it until I found out. Half the states publicly invest pension funds in order to build community stability, targeting jobs to their local communities. Many of them, about half, also in, have venture capital funds where they take back ownership of stock. The Bush administration owns shares in some of these airlines right now. They wouldn't give the loans without share ownership. Uh, but the state, state developments are very interesting because it gives you a handle on both stability and another element of control. In California, the CalPERS, CalPERS is particularly interesting. That's the California um, Public Pension Fund. They not only invest for community stability, they invest to control the way corporations handle their environmental policy, their civil rights policy, their trade policies, and they have power on the management boards that is very, very great, and they're beginning to use it as an odd way to control the corporation rather than the way it is now, which is largely uncontrolled by anybody except the directors. And the directors are basically subservient to management. Footnote. Two days ago, the New York Times read, I don't know if you all saw this, front page story on corporate compensation. The way in which corporate compensation boards set fees and set salaries is a company with whom the corporation management is doing business, like accounting, brings in a team and tells the corporation what it should pay the manager who's just given them the contract for $2 million for the accounting. It's, ext it's an extreme scandal, but what it represents is the extreme and narrow power of the people who actually run the corporations. Footnote two, the ownership of these entities that are largely uncontrolled, but which some of the models I'm beginning to sketch point towards different models of control and design, the ownership now of the wealth of the nation, corporate wealth, the latest estimate is that 1% of the population owns 57% of the corporate stock. You live in a feudal society. 1%, 57.5 is the latest estimate, 2003 data, owns these entities. The last time the data was run on, the t on sales of stocks and bonds, corporate, the top two-tenths of 1%, two-tenths of 1% made more money in the most recent data on the sale of stocks and bonds than everyone else in the entire society taken together. 
This is no longer 19th century small business capitalism. It isn't even 20th century corporate capitalism. It is a feudal structure, almost uncontrolled by anybody. So the design of alternative ways to control this giant entity at the heart of the political economy for democratic reasons as well as ecological reasons is a problem that we all need to grapple with. And some of the answers that are beginning to emerge piece by piece at the grassroots level suggest different pieces of the puzzle. I'm going to come back to a larger design problem, but they involve the use of public resources in the cities and in the public uh, pension funds to manage and control and get access and making them quasi-public and responsive through ownership. They involve breaking down some to worker and ownership ownership by those people who live there and don't get up and leave, by the way, worker-owned companies. They involve a mix of municipal ownership of parts of the economy. I've just suggested some of that. Some parts of it, cooperative ownership. Many nonprofits are going into business to establishing ownership of a different form. If you think what I'm suggesting to you is that there is a burgeoning substructure of alternative corporate forms developing beneath the surface in the United States that is very large and very large scale and fast moving, if you think that's what I'm saying, I am indeed saying that. That largely out of pain and largely unnoticed, we are beginning, in my view, to develop the ingredients of the next solution to the problem of the largest corporations through this experimentation and through the pain that is causing people to have to do difficult things with experiments. Now, a lot of experiments and as a friend of mine used to say, a lot of experiments in a quarter would get you a cup of coffee in 1922. Will it get you anything? Will a bunch of experiments get you anywhere in the future? And what might make it possible to go forward? Let me, let me address that question directly, but I want to say the fourth element on my view of the design characteristics that we need to grapple with for the long haul, if we want an answer, is the problem of time. Now, you can't have citizens without people having time to be citizens. That's just not, a, again, that's not a nice proposition. That's a requirement. And in many parts of the country, people are so overburdened with work and time loads that they can't participate. Leaving aside they don't have the education, they don't have the time. They've got to put bread on the table for their family, and they're working two jobs, and it is not possible. So the long haul solution, it seems quite clear, is either radical reductions, probably both, radical reductions in what we deem important for consumption, material consumption, which can reduce time burdens, and an allocation of resources in order to provide people with money in order to provide them with less requirement of work. The earned income tax credit today for people who are working provides supplements from the federal government to people who can't support a family but are working. An expansion of the earned income system ultimately may also be a way, Jerome Siegel's written a great deal about this, to subsidize time from the point of view of the healthy life but also from the point of view of how do you get democratic participation. But time is critical. We were talking this morning in a seminar, the increase in output over the 20th century per capita was about sevenfold. That is from 1900 to the year, to, to, to the year 2000, sevenfold increase in per capita output, partly energy, partly technology, etc. If that happens, it's about 140,000 right now per family of four. By the end of the 21st century, if that trend were to continue, it would be about a million dollars for every four people in production and output. It isn't going to continue. But even if it were halfway there, or a third of the way there, you're still talking 500 or 300,000 relative output or 20 hour weeks, 10 hour weeks if you distribute the time benefits of the technology that we're emerging into properly. But time becomes important. Let me back up and try to summarize some of this and then we'll talk just a little bit about politics because I think we'll run out of time if we don't. What I'm suggesting to you, and one last piece about time, I think you all know about the Alaska Permanent Fund as well. The Alaska Permanent Fund now is another model, again, of in the United States of America of different ways that own and control corporations or investment streams. 
one quarter of the oil revenues go into a permanent fund which is invested and as a matter of constitutional right every citizen of the state as a matter of constitutional right gets dividends from that uh, in the year 2000 which I think was their highest payout year it's everyone that's including babies a family with three kids five people got ten thousand dollars as a matter of legal right so it's another form of distributing resources in order to provide either supplements for income or time anyway uh, and I find I should mention one last bit of this because if you want to see the most interesting experimentation by a state with public investment to provide alternative models of job creation and community stability you go to the state of Alabama where the public pension fund invests in worker-owned companies in the state of Alabama and many other industries in order to keep jobs and stabilize the state so it's very interesting Alaska and Alabama are both very conservative states but they have the most intriguing models of developmenting process developmental processes involving alternative structures well what I am suggesting to you there is a design problem which is logical and difficult it needs to be faced answers to the design problem I suggest are involve the problem of scale continents the problem of building democracy at the bottom up which involves stability as well worker owned companies are one piece of that they don't get up and run to Mexico or China they keep jobs there as well as our, an alternative design form the problem of time which is allocation of resources and ultimately how do you control large scale entities corporate or, bureau, or socialist bureau, bureaucratic the elements scale time and small scale democratic recontrol are part and parcel of what it takes ultimately in my view to control large corporate entities people with a lot of time a lot of democratic experience in smaller scale units can build upon the California model or the Alabama model so that their representatives in their state or regional government can actually get a handle on these entities as you're beginning to get in those states if you move down that path so you begin to see a sketch or a skeleton of an alternative model that uses the power of the public but also builds the public in a different way which might also allow you to get a handle on the ecological problems short sketch that begins to be a starting place for debate I want to suggest not an answer a starting point for debate about what the system design is that could meet your requirements so the contention is that those four elements community democracy and its requirement changing the ownership pattern to some form of quasi public or public in the various ways from co-ops to public cities and states and, co and worker owned companies in the various states that are emerging is necessary ingredient of the answer changing the scale and ultimately the hardest one perhaps along with the corporation is moving towards providing time through the resources that are captured this way so those are design elements to chew on if you need a political economy that might support ecological goals I would suggest can you get there brief version I am a prudent optimist because I'm a historian as well as a political economist systems change all the time systemic change is the name name of the game historically and whether that that whether you believe that in terms of our own system or not most people don't believe it in their own society until it happens I don't think as you might as much must be obvious that liberal reform or simply the development of a culture or simply the development of projectism or simply reframing will get us where we need to go on the other hand I also don't think that the conservative forces have full control of the system I think they are stalemated and blocked now well, that's a very odd situation historically where the system does not collapse where traditional reform does not succeed liberalism and environmentalism in the traditional form and where the right wing conservatives don't get full control and are more and more delegitimated too that's a specific contextual development if it's correct that is neither reform nor revolution it could simply decay it could turn to fascism it could turn to nuclear war but it could also and this is very interesting for small d democrats it could also establish the context you're living in it now 
we all are, in which growing disillusionment with the way things are, the failure of the existing models to solve real problems, growing social and economic pain establishes the context in which people are forced to think deeper and deeper thoughts and experiment deeper and deeper in new ways. Laying the groundwork, new models, new ideas, new understanding, laying the groundwork potentially for a larger transformation when the politics is possible again. That's a very strange situation. Some people call that a reconstructive context, meaning reform accepts the existing institutions and tries to clean up around the edges of it. That's traditional environmentalism, and we need it. We need resistance movements like the environmental movement. I use that term precisely. We are resisting and slowing down worsening trends going backwards, but it's very important to resist. Liberalism is a resistance movement now, it's not a progressive movement. The inequality is growing and we are resisting the decay, not achieving greater equality. But resistance movements are important even as the new models and the new ideas and the new theories and the new practical on the ground citizen development goes forward and lays groundwork for the next move. That happened prior to the progressive era. All of the reforms that were called the New Deal were established at the local and state level prior to the New Deal time. And it is the way many, many forms, capitalism itself, developed in that particular form. I think possibly, possibly, we are in a period, if you want to play this game, you have to throw a couple decades of your life on the table. That's what I mean by a period. We are in a period where we are have the challenge, the responsibility, the opportunity to begin to think sufficiently strongly about the requirements of a systemic change I told you it was a heavy rap that we are the people who will design the next system and lay the groundwork for it if we're up to it that means the pieces of projects but also not being satisfied with easy answers that we know aren't going to solve the problem but still being aware that history sometimes establishes context in which disillusionment, pain, difficulties, and new experiments develop the preconditions of the next move forward. My heroes, and this will be the last thing I say, my heroes are the people, I said I'd come back to the civil rights movement, my, my heroes are the people in Mississippi in the 1930s and 40s. They're the ones that established the groundwork for what became the civil rights movement. So I think in a certain sense that if we are in fact facing a systemic crisis and not simply a political crisis and not simply an environmental crisis, we all are in Mississippi, if you like, if we want to be and if we want to step up to the challenge of the next design. Thank you very much. <laughs>